a switch port can work in two modes, access mode and trunk mode. In access mode, it removes VLAN information from all frames before forwarding them. In trunk mode, it keeps VLAN information. Based on mode it works, it is known as either an access port or a trunk port. If we configure a switch port in access mode, it will be called an access port. If we configure it in trunk mode, it will be known as a trunk port. A switch uses VLAN information to group devices and creates boundaries for broadcast messages. A VLAN is a switch-only feature. End devices do not understand VLAN information. If we connect an end device with a trunk port, the end device will receive frames with the VLAN information. Since an end device does not understand frames containing VLAN information, it drops them. An end device will accept frames only when it receives them in their original formats. An access port forwards frames in their original formats. Because of this, we always connect an end device only with an access port. We use a trunk port to connect the switch port with another switch or a router. Before we take more differences between an access port and a trunk port, let us understand three basic terms, layers, broadcast, and VLAN. Networking models define how devices communicate on a network. There are two popular networking models, OSI and TCP IP. Both models divide the communication process into layers. OSI divides it into seven layers. TCP IP divides it into five layers. Each layer defines a specific part of the communication. A device can work in a single layer or multiple layers. For example, Ethernet cables we use to connect end devices work in layer 1. Ethernet switches work in both layers 1 and 2. Routers work in layers 1, 2, and 3. End devices such as a PC and server work in all layers. Each layer processes data in different formats. It means a device will understand and process data only in its supported format. For example, layer 1 uses data in the form of signals. A hub works only on layer 1. It will understand and process data only in the form of signals. An Ethernet switch works on layer 2. Layer 2 processes data in the form of frames. A frame contains the hardware address of the source and destination devices. A switch uses source addresses to learn about the connected devices and destination addresses to make forwarding decisions. It saves the source addresses of all connected devices in a table known as the CAM table. A router is a layer 3 device. Layer 3 processes data in the form of packets. A packet contains the software address of the source and destination devices. Just like a switch uses hardware addresses to make forwarding decisions, a router uses software addresses to make forwarding decisions. A broadcast is a layer 3 message. It represents all devices in the local segment. When a device sends a broadcast message, the message reaches all devices connected in the local segment. Many functions depend on broadcast messages. End devices generate a lot of broadcast messages every minute. Broadcast messages consume a big chunk of network bandwidth. All devices on the local segment receive a broadcast message, whether the message is for them or not. For example, if we configure a DHCP server on a network, the DHCP server will provide IP configurations to all devices we will configure as DHCP clients. DHCP clients use broadcast messages to communicate with the DHCP server. A broadcast message sent by a DHCP client is meaningful only for the DHCP server. It is useless for other DHCP clients. It is just a single example. End devices generate many broadcast messages useful only for a few end devices. Most of the time, they receive meaningless broadcast messages. It decreases the network performance. To limit broadcast messages, we can break the network into smaller subnets. A subnet is a group of IP addresses having its own network and broadcast addresses. The process of breaking a subnet into smaller subnets is called subnetting. Since each subnet uses a separate network and broadcast address, subnetting reduces usable IP addresses. For example, a default Class C network contains 256 IP addresses. After excluding the network and broadcast addresses, it has 254 usable IP addresses. If we break this network into two subnets, each subnet will get 128 IP addresses. Both subnets will reserve two addresses, one for the network address and another for the broadcast address. If we exclude these addresses from all addresses, we get 126 usable addresses in each subnet. If we sum the usable addresses of both subnets, we get less usable addresses than the original subnet. But it is only one side of the coin. On the other side, now we have two separate broadcast domains. End devices listen to broadcast messages only on the broadcast address that belongs to their subnet. They do not listen to the broadcast address of the other subnet. 
For example, if we configure these devices in the first subnet and these devices in the second subnet, there will be two separate broadcast domains. A device in the first subnet will send broadcast messages to this address. Since all devices on this subnet listen to this broadcast address, it will reach them. The devices on the second subnet do not listen to this address. If they receive this message, they will ignore it. This way, subnetting limits broadcast messages, but there is an issue. Subnetting uses layer 3 addresses, and switches do not work in layer 3. Since switches do not understand layer 3 addresses, they use their own logic to make forwarding decisions. They forward broadcast messages to all connected devices. As we can see here, broadcast messages generated in one subnet are reaching to another subnet. It makes subnetting useless. VLAN solves this problem. It allows us to define subnets on switch ports. If we use this feature, the switch will forward broadcast frames within the subnet. The subnets we create on the switch are known as VLANs. Or we can say a VLAN defines a subnet on the switch we use to control broadcast on layer 3. Once implemented, the switch forwards frames only inside the VLANs. It never forwards frames between VLANs. Let us understand this process in more detail. A switch has many ports. It forwards an incoming frame only from the port connected to the destination device of the frame. We can divide this process into three phases, learning, decision-making, and forwarding. In the learning phase, a switch learns the addresses of all connected devices and saves them into a table known as the CAM table. It uses incoming frames to learn the addresses. Let us understand this process through an example. When a PC wants to send a data stream, it breaks the data stream into small pieces, known as segments. There are two types of addresses, software addresses, and hardware addresses. The device needs to attach both types of addresses to each segment. It first adds software addresses. Software addresses are also known as IP addresses. A segment with IP addresses is known as a packet. After adding the software addresses, the device attaches the hardware addresses. Hardware addresses are also known as MAC addresses. A packet with MAC addresses is known as a frame. A switch understands and uses only hardware addresses to process frames. When it receives a frame, it reads the source MAC address and destination MAC address of the frame. It uses the source address to learn about the connected device. It uses the destination address to make forwarding decision. It saves source addresses in a table known as the CAM table. The CAM table has three fields, MAC address, port, and aging. In the MAC address field, it saves the MAC address the frame has in the source field. In the port field, it saves the port's information on which the switch received the frame. In the aging field, it saves a timer. It assigns a separate timer to each entry of the CAM table. This timer is used to age out old entries from the CAM table, allowing room to store new entries. A switch uses a relatively simple concept to forward a frame. It finds the destination MAC address of the incoming frame in the CAM table. If the CAM table has an entry for the destination MAC address, it forwards the frame from the port mentioned in the entry. If the CAM table does not have an entry for the destination MAC address, it forward the frame from all ports except the port on which it arrived. The process of forwarding a frame from all ports except the port on which it arrived is called frame flooding. A switch floods a frame if it has an unknown unicast, multicast, or broadcast address in the destination address field. An unknown unicast address is an address that is not available in the CAM table. A multicast address belongs to a group of devices. A broadcast address belongs to all devices on the local network. Multicast and broadcast are destination-only addresses. These addresses are never used in the source address field of a frame. Since these addresses are never used in the source address field of a frame and a switch uses the frame's source field to learn addresses, a switch never learns about these addresses. These addresses always remain unknown to the switch. And as we know, a switch always floods a frame having an unknown address in the destination address field. After making a forwarding decision, the switch finds ports having the same VLAN configuration as the incoming port. It forwards the frame only from the ports having the same VLAN configuration. By default, all switch ports belong to VLAN 1. VLAN 1 is the default VLAN on all Cisco switches. We can create custom VLANs in global configuration mode and apply them to switch ports. If two switch ports belong to different VLANs, they do not share broadcast messages. If two ports belong to the same VLAN, they share broadcast messages. Let us understand this process through an example. PC1 generates a unicast frame for PC4. The MAC address of PC4 is MAC4. It configures the value MAC4 in the destination address field of the frame. The frame reaches the switch on the port 1. The switch checks the CAM table to make the forwarding decision. 
the CAM table has an entry for the destination address MAC4. From this entry, the switch decides to forward the frame from port 7. After making the forwarding decision, the switch checks the VLAN configuration. If the destination port's VLAN ID matches the source port's VLAN ID, it forwards the frame. If the destination port's VLAN ID does not match the source port's VLAN ID, it discards the frame. Since we haven't changed the default VLAN ID of any port so far and the default VLAN ID of all ports is 1, the VLAN ID of the source and destination ports match. The switch forwards the frame from port 7 and the frame reaches the PC4. Now suppose, PC1 generates a broadcast frame. It configures the broadcast address in the destination address field of the frame. The frame reaches the switch on the port 1. The switch checks the CAM table to make the forwarding decision. As explained earlier, a broadcast is a destination-only address. A switch never learns and adds this address to the CAM table. Since the CAM table has no entry for the broadcast address, the switch decides to forward it from all ports. After making the forwarding decision, the switch checks the VLAN configuration to finalize the ports. Since all ports have the default VLAN ID, it forwards the frame from all ports except the port on which it received the frame. Now suppose, we want the broadcast originating from PC1 to reach only PC2 and 3. We don't want them to reach PC4. In this situation, we need to change the default VLAN ID of ports 1, 2, and 8. Let us suppose, we change the default VLAN ID of these ports to 10. Now let us monitor another broadcast frame originating from PC1 to understand how the switch will process broadcast frames after this change. PC1 generates the broadcast frame. The frame reaches port 1. As usual, the switch checks the CAM table to decide the forwarding ports. Since the CAM table has no entry for the destination address, the switch decides to forward the frame from all ports except the source port. After selecting the forwarding ports, it matches their VLAN ID with the source port. Since the VLAN ID of ports 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 do not match the VLAN ID of the source port, it excludes these ports from the forwarding ports. After excluding the port having the different VLAN ID, it forwards the broadcast frame only from the ports having the same VLAN ID. The switch uses the same steps for multicast frames. This way, VLANs allow us to create a group of devices that can exchange broadcast and multicast messages. This concept perfectly works on a single switch. But if the network has more than one switch, or we want to create the same VLAN over multiple switches, this concept does not work. Let us take an example. This network has two switches. Each switch has two PCs. Now, suppose we want to create two VLANs on this network. VLAN 10 and VLAN 20. We want to keep PC1 and PC3 in the VLAN 10 and PC2 and PC4 in the VLAN 20. For this, we create VLAN 10 and 20 on both switches and change the default VLAN ID on ports connected to PCs. Now, port 1 belongs to VLAN 10, and port 6 belongs to VLAN 20 on both switches. Now, let's see what happens when PC1 generates a broadcast frame. The broadcast frame reaches port 1. Since it is a broadcast frame, the switch decides to forward it from all ports having the VLAN ID 10. Since no other ports have the VLAN ID 10, it drops the frame. The same thing happens when PC2, PC3, and PC4 generate broadcast frames. PC3 and PC4 never receive broadcast frames generated by PC1 and PC2. We have two options to solve this problem. Let us discuss the first option first. The first option creates as many connections between switches as many VLANs they have and configure a connection in each VLAN. For example, if we have 5 VLANs, we need 5 connections. Here, we have 2 VLANs, hence we need 2 connections, one for each VLAN. Let us understand this requirement in more detail. As we know, by default all switch ports are access ports. An access port can have only one VLAN ID. The default VLAN ID is one on all ports. Let us implement these default rules on this network and see how it works. Here, we have one connection on access ports. Since these are access ports, we can configure only one VLAN ID. The default VLAN ID is 1. Let's change it to VLAN 10. Now suppose PC1 generates a broadcast frame. The frame reaches port 1. The port 1 belongs to VLAN 10. The switch forwards it from all ports having the VLAN ID 10. Since port 8 belongs to VLAN 10, it forwards the frame from this port. The frame reaches port 8 of the switch 2. Port 8 belongs to VLAN 10. The switch forwards the frame from all ports having the VLAN ID 10. Since port 1 belongs to VLAN 10, it forwards the frame from it. 
the frame reaches PC3. By following the same path, broadcast frames generated by PC3 reach PC1. This setup enables communication in only VLAN 10. Devices in VLAN 20 cannot use this connection. Let us suppose, PC2 generates a broadcast frame. The frame reaches port 6. Since port 6 belongs to VLAN 20, the switch can forward it only from ports having VLAN ID 20. Since no other port belongs to VLAN 20, it drops the frame. To allow communication in VLAN 20, we need a separate connection. Let us create a new connection and configure both end ports in VLAN 20. Now devices in VLAN 20 can use this connection to communicate. Let us suppose PC2 generates a broadcast frame. The frame reaches port 6. The port 6 belongs to VLAN 20. The switch forwards it from all ports having the VLAN ID 20. Since port 7 belongs to VLAN 20, it forwards the frame from this port. The frame reaches port 7 of the switch 2. Port 7 belongs to VLAN 20. The switch forwards the frame from all ports having the VLAN ID 20. Since port 6 belongs to VLAN 20, it forwards the frame from it. The frame reaches PC4. By following the same path, broadcast frames generated by PC4 reach PC2. Now devices in both VLANs can communicate. Since this method requires as many connections between the switches as many VLANs they have, normally administrators do not use it. Administrators use the second method which is more convenient and easy. The second method does not need many connections. Only one connection between switches is enough to allow communication between all VLANs. Actually, it uses trunk ports to connect switches. Trunk ports are special ports. They add VLAN information to all outgoing frames and remove it from all incoming frames. Let us see how it works. PC1 generates a broadcast frame. The frame reaches port 1. The port 1 belongs to VLAN 10. The switch decides to forward it from all ports having VLAN ID 10. Since a trunk port belongs to all VLANs, the switch decides to forward it from this port. But there is a twist. A trunk port does not forward the frame in its original format. Before forwarding the frame, it adds VLAN information to the frame. For example, this frame belongs to VLAN 10, the port adds a header to this frame. The header includes the VLAN ID. After adding the VLAN header, it forwards the frame. The modified frame reaches port 8 of switch 2. Since it is a trunk port, it can read the modified frame. It reads the VLAN header to know about the recipient VLAN. From the header, it learns the frame is intended for VLAN 10. After learning about the recipient VLAN, it removes the VLAN header from the frame and forwards the frame from all ports having VLAN ID 10. PC3 receives the frame in its original format from port 1. Now let's say, PC4 generates a broadcast frame. The frame reaches port 6. The VLAN ID of port 6 is 20. The trunk port adds a VLAN header containing VLAN 20 to the frame and forwards it. The frame reaches switch 1 on the trunk port. The trunk port reads VLAN information from the header and removes it. After removing the header, it gives the frame to all ports having the VLAN ID 20. The ports in VLAN 20 forward the frame in its original format. This way a single trunk connection is enough to exchange all VLAN traffic between two switches. Let us discuss the main differences between access ports and trunk ports again. An access port belongs to only one VLAN. A trunk port belongs to all VLANs. An access port forwards the frame in its original format. A trunk port forwards the frame after adding the VLAN header. An access port connects an end device to the network. A trunk port extends the network. By default, all switch ports are access ports. By default, no switch port is a trunk port. That's all for this video. If you have any suggestions, comments, or feedback about this video, please share them in the comment section given below.